Hi, Martin. It's uh, Andrew Staten here from Wilmar TV. Uh, it's an honour to have you on our show. Um, and today I'm going to try and get through as much as I can about the Sifu Martin O'Neill. So basically, without cutting any sort of like shortcomings, what was your introduction to martial arts? How did you get involved? I'll tell you what it was. It was Kung Fu on the TV, David Carradine. That caught my attention. Um, and about that time, I think I had bought a Bruce Tegner book, something to do with karate. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, me and my friend used to go out to the back shed and beat each other up out of that book, hitting each other. And uh, it was kind of ridiculous uh, trying to learn it like that way. So uh, when we saw David Carradine, we watched it every, I think it was every Friday or Saturday evening. And it was like, it was amazing. And I thought, how's this guy fighting all these people? And what's that weird stuff he's doing? And uh, But the philosophy got me. That was my introduction to Eastern philosophy or any kind of philosophy. So that really caught my attention and my friend's attention, but mostly me, I think, at that time. Um, so from there, I was kind of hooked. And I think a lot of people were were uh, were hooked that way as well through that, that uh, Kung Fu program. Yeah. I didn't know about Bruce Lee at that time. I hadn't got a clue who he was. Um, and then... Um, I was living in Dublin. My dad got me a job away from Northern Ireland because of the trouble and the conflict that was here. And he, I think he was afraid of me getting caught up in it and hurt. Some of my friends were were uh, were killed and uh, there was a lot of bad stuff going on. So I think he, he got me, uh, he got my older brother who was living in Dublin to get me a job uh as a welder now i was an apprentice at that time and i went to dublin and bluffed my way as a full-time journeyman welder uh so i managed to i just I'm, well I, I was really flying by the seat of my pants um but I, I made up for it in hard work you know so i did work hard for the guy uh so i worked all over ireland at that stage and um ended up uh, when I when I was in Dublin, I went to what was called the Parnell Square Dojo in in Dublin. And it was run by Brian McCarthy, who went on to found ninjutsu in Europe. He became an, uh, the head kind of ninjutsu instructor. But at that stage, he was he was a Wataru karate instructor, a very good instructor at, at, at what he was doing, very hard instructor. And uh, he put us through our paces. And it was it was a tough club, a lot of quite a brutal kind of full contact kind of fighting regime that the they did. Uh, very little. There was no armor plating available. Very little in the way of uh, protective equipment. And I didn't know what a gum shield was. And I lost a few teeth to uh, <laughs> some vicious roundhouse kicking. Uh, got knocked out a couple of times. And uh, it was a school of hard knocks. Uh, so uh, th that was my introduction to, and I, I thought at that stage I didn't know any better. I thought that was kung fu. I thought you know that's that's definitely what David Carradine's doing, and I'd heard of Bruce Lee at that stage, and his movies started to come out, Fist of Fury and so on. So when I went to see that, everybody was kicking each other down the street in O'Connell Street in Dublin. Young lads bounced out of the cinema and just booted each other down the road, all <laughs> fighting. Doing Kung Fu, imitating uh, Bruce Lee. So uh, I, it kind of really caught my attention and I really wanted to find out more about it. So um, eventually then I got in contact with uh, the Kraus brothers in Glasgow, who at that stage were, I think they were apprentice instructors with Sifu Dan and Asanto. And they were running an apprentice scheme. So I went and approached them. They had been brought over to uh, Ireland by Liam MacDonald. And I went to their seminar and I thought, God, these guys are amazing. They could do everything. They were they, they were just real showmen and really uh, presented fantastically well. Uh, so that kind of caught me and I thought, this has got to be what Bruce Lee did. So uh, I just bought into that for uh, about five or six years I was I, I finished my apprenticeship with them and at that stage I'd met I'd met Rick Young and uh 
did a little bit of training with Rick and, you know, amazing instructor, really a uh, superb human being. Um, so then I explored a bit further then and I got in contact with uh, Lamar Davis, Sifu Lamar Davis, who's a, a real no-nonsense, original kind of JKD instructor, makes no bones about it and follows Bruce Lee's uh, curriculum to the, the nth degree and uh, accepts nothing else, the only, only that. So I trained with Lamar, went on, I became an apprentice with him and became a full instructor with him after about nine or ten years of training. And Lamar was uh, very good to me, very good instructor. And when I was training with Lamar, I went to um, the uh, Seattle uh, Bruce Lee Conference is that what it was called? I can't remember exactly. Yeah, was, it the new, was it the nucleus? When is it one of the new nucleus? Yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the I nucleus. didn't know. Yeah, um, it was John Van Jeekundo nucleus. That was it. That was it. Um, I didn't know what what that was at the time, but I went along anyway because I knew all the Bruce Lee guys would be there, his original students and Linda Lee and so on. So I went. I went there, and it was it was it was peculiar, and well, it was. I don't know what what to make of it because we went to Bruce and Brandon's grave and um, Linda gave a, a beautiful a beautiful uh, oration and I would have everybody got very emotional and I was standing there kind of stunned and Taki Kimura came over to me and started talking to me and Seagong Taki I kind of I recognized who he was he hadn't got a clue who I was but that was the start of my uh, introduction and relationship with Seagong Taki because from that then I got in contact with his son uh, Sifu Andy and invited him and John Little and James Bishop to Ireland to do a series uh, lecture tour uh, on and focusing on Bruce Lee's philosophy not as martial art as such but more as ideas. Uh, the, the whole thing about self-actualization and Empowerment was was uh, fantastic. So we did uh, the, the guys did a lecture in Queen's University in Belfast and in Trinity Trinity College in Dublin. And when I went to book the Belfast was a was a breeze to book, but when I went to Trinity College, I had to go and see the guy who was in charge of all the facilities. And he said, What do you want the lecture hall for? We're very particular about who we let in here. So I told him I was doing, I was bringing people down to do a lecture on Bruce Lee's philosophy. And he looked at me as if I had two heads. He sort of went, are you crazy? And <laughs> I, could, I knew what he was thinking. Um, so uh, the, the, the lecture, he let us do the lecture and the lecture was great. And uh, the guys were interviewed on RTE radio um, by one of the DJs there who was a Bruce Lee fan. Yeah, so it was kind of amazing. Um, so from that, then I became, I became, a, a, a student and eventually an instructor with Seagung Taki and Andy, and I've been with them ever since. And then about 10 years ago, I went and, uh, I was, I was at the, um, uh, Sifu Dan and Asanto's, uh, seminar over in Rome and, me and a few, me and a couple of my students were there wearing the uh, the John Fan Kung Fu Institute shirts. So I got I got chatting to him and I got chatting to uh, Cookie Vasilio, and I said, "Well, what's the what, what's the uh, chances of becoming an apprentice on you know under Guru, under Sifu Dan?" And he came over and spoke to me and he he looked me up and down and he said. He says, what age are you, sir? And I said, I think I was 54 at the time. And he said, you're you're pretty fit. Um, and he was he asked me a bit about uh, studying with uh, Seagong Taki and so on. So, uh, you know, he, he you were then brought out in front of the audience of instructors, about 50 instructors, and you were told to do stuff, you know, shadow spar and do kicks and punches and what have you. So I got through there by the skin of my teeth. And, uh, you know, I'm... I'm honored to be uh, you know on his instructor course as well um so i'm i'm kind of blessed in that in that sense that i've been around 
around the world for a shortcut and uh, and have you know these wonderful people who have taught me. So it's kind of it's been a it's been a dream in a way. Uh, what would you what would you say when you were training with with uh, Sigun um, Takakimura? What do you think you got from him? What 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 was different, and and how did you feel? What 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 was the difference between sort of like hard karate to you know um, where you were going with JKD, and especially with Lamar, who's who's straight core JKD. How did you find that? It's it's really a lot of it is very similar or the same thing in terms of emphasis. Uh, when I, when I'm when I'm training with uh, when I was training with uh, Seagung Taki, God rest him, and and recently and uh, this year with 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 Andy, the the ideas are the same. It's it's the 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 five ways of attack, the kind of the footwork, the mobility, the uh, the energy sensitivity, the kicking, the punching, the movement. It's all the same thing. Um, there's very little, I don't think there's any difference in what they teach and what uh, Sifu Dan teaches when he's teaching his Jeet Kune Do. You know, people say that, you know, one teaches something other than the other one teaches, but to me, it's it's very, very similar. People say then, you know, and, and historically then thinking that, you know, the original John Fan is very different than the uh, uh, the Jeet Kune Do in the Chinatown school. And there are some differences in, in terms of the boxing and the mobility and so on, but not a great deal of difference in terms of the um, how it works. So I, I, I don't see a massive amount of difference with it. Um, when I was training with uh, Sifu Lamar Davis, it was this, it's, you know, the emphasis was very much on the original curriculum. And he doesn't veer from that, but neither did Seagung Taki yeah. or or Andy really, um, or or Sifu Dan when they're asked to do and and show Jeet Kune Do or the Jun Fan method. That's what you get. Yeah. It's the same thing. Maybe the interpretation's different, um, and I think that you know the Seattle people and and Sifu Andy and uh, they they are the torchbearers of the early era of that. And you know, I totally respect that because that's part of the it's part of the historical record, if you like, and it's part of the 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 lineage and the, I suppose the ancestry of it. Because then if you go back, you know, if you go back further, you 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 can see then where the Wing Chun influenced it. Um and one of the things that I've noticed over the years is that um without doing without having some good uh, basic Wing Chun. It Jeet Kune Do doesn't really it, it becomes sort of like super karate if you like because the energy sensitivity the energy <laughs> sensitivity isn't really there so yeah. you know and I think there's nothing wrong with with karate I think karate is fantastic martial art um, but I think that in terms of the Wing Chun influence on the Jun Fan and the Jeet Kune Do I think oh. that without it it's kind of like missing a wheel, I suppose you could say. Well, when I was in was when I was in Seattle and training with um, Sigung Taki, I mean, he at that time um, they hadn't spoken or not trained very much with the um, you know the, the Los Angeles people, um, mm. and you know he came to me at, at that time and he said it's kind of a, a modern version of Wing Chun, uh, what he was showing down on the underneath the thrifty star. Uh, which was Taki's old uh, studio, you know, where where he was. Yeah. So I absolutely, uh, totally agree with you. I think a good grounding in Wing Chun, uh, just the basics, is a good starting point for for anything. Um, I mean, you can throw away bits and pieces later, but at that, let's move on a minute because I'm really interested in in what you did in Ireland, and that you have this these philosophical lectures. Um, how well were they received, and and what do you feel you got from them? I think they went down very well. And when you talk about philosophy to, to some martial artists, they just go, "Well, that's just you know, forget about that. We want to fight, you know." So <laughs> some of them are like that, and some of my instructors have been like that. You know, they just go like, you know, philosophy is just bunk. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
you know, forget about that. I'm going to teach you how to fill somebody in and knock them out in like two seconds flat. And I, I kind of go, well, that's okay, but I don't want to, unless I really had to fight somebody and I'm getting too old now that, you know, I have to just keep talking my way out of trouble. Uh, so, you know, the philosophy is important. A lot of the guys who came along to the lectures, they were kind of stunned because they, they, they kind of they knew Bruce Lee as a warrior, but they didn't know him as a philosopher or as a, as a poet or as a, a thinker. So that was set in front of them and, and me as well, because John Little, as you know, was kind of like very intellectual. James Bishop, you know, was now a, a doctor of psychology and Andy's a very, very eloquent person as well. So you had these key speakers and you kind of just, it just blew everybody away. And you had to go sort of go out of the room and you kind of go, well, I've just had a, my brain kind of exploded here and I need to think about this. But really what they were saying was about, you know, Bruce Lee saying to people, you know, don't miss the, you know, don't mistake the, the, don't be looking at the finger point and look at the heavenly glory, if you like. And he was showing young, young people, especially over what I wanted them to see in young people in, in Northern Ireland, uh, especially and, and, and in other places was there's a better way than just hatred and to smash through hatred and sectarianism and racism and, and oppression. That was his way. And using him as a as a kind of image or as a man who had kind of blown through that because he faced that all the time. And he he sort of what struck me about him was that when people put him down and disliked him or even hated him, he never hated them back. He, and that's really was the message I wanted to see for him coming to, to especially to Belfast was that, you know, there's so much hatred and sectarianism there and we're, we're getting over it slowly, but it's a very, very slow process. But that that was the important message was him as a, as a beacon of light in the midst of a lot of hatred. So that's the thing that I got from it more than anything else. Plus meeting those guys and hanging out with them and sinking lots of pints against us with them in Dublin was a that was a good fun as well. Yeah. Um, you you um, did the JKD and Bruce Lee philosophies. Did you ever bring it into your social work and um, you know and apply what you knew what Bruce Lee was doing um, to your everyday job? Yes. Uh, it was important, and I, and I started doing it as a kind of natural thing, I, without really thinking about it too much. Uh, and I was using Bruce, some of Bruce Lee's ideas about empowerment and self development and awareness with people who were having a really difficult time uh, emotionally, uh, psychologically, people who had been abused uh, and who were living in poverty, and using some of those ideas appropriately with people about, you know, trying to raise their horizons a little bit and uh, helping them to help themselves was extremely important. So some other people, uh, the likes of John Little, James Bishop Tacky as well, and Andy saw that in, in what I was doing. And I wasn't really, I was doing it as a kind of natural thing. I wasn't doing it deliberately. But they were able to 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 make connections that maybe I wasn't consciously making, and they did say to me about it, and they were sort of saying, "Do you are you doing this? Are you using Bruce's ideas in 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 your work?" And I went, "Yeah, I think I am." And then I started <laughs> then I started developing the, those a bit more and sort of thinking a bit more consciously uh, about them. So I think that was something that other people observe in my social work practice uh, that I wasn't really thinking about too much. I was just doing it as part of me. And then when when John Little and Andy and, and Taki said that to me, I went, oh, that's interesting that other people could observe that and what I was doing and what I was, was, was speaking about. And I put a little bit of that in my book as well in terms of helping people. Uh, so I, I think that the Jeet Kune Do message is is much more than punching somebody on the nose. I think it's much more deeper than that. I think when people just think about it, it's that it's just about you know, you know, knocking somebody out. I I think it's 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 way beyond that. 
Um, yeah. you, you did um, a fantastic book a few years ago. Can you tell mm. us the inspiration for the book? What I wanted to do was was sort of give people that positive message that I've just been speaking about that Bruce Lee had and that I have in, in terms of what, what I believe in myself was that people can change and you don't have to be a, a, a prisoner of, of uh, whatever life throws at you. You can raise yourself up. You can raise your horizons. You can uh, develop yourself, develop yourself as a person, as a thinker. You can develop your body as a martial artist. You can get fitter and more healthy and mindful of, of life and the idea of self-help in the best possible sense of that word. And then by doing that was then that you can help others. But I think that you need to get your act together before you start helping others. There are people out there who uh, try to help others without, and we know that they maybe need a bit of help themselves. So there's projection goes on as well. But for me, uh, you know, my background then went from being a, a a welder to a 30 year social work career. And that was a bit of a leap, I can tell you, because I went from at one stage of my life making making dustbins to uh, <laughs> yeah, and check, uh, catching chickens. And it was another <laughs> job that I had. So I went from there to uh, discovering the Open University and that changed my life. Uh, so thanks to them. The book was, was then me you know, retiring from my social work job early because I had a heart attack and it nearly killed me. And I had to rethink what I was doing. I, I retired early and I was I was kind of concerned that I was I was kind of going to lose the plot because I went from being in a very busy, pressurized environment, expected to write strategic papers and policy documents and all this kind of stuff uh, to just standing still. So I said, I better write, I better write something down because my brain's going to turn into cabbage water. So I started <laughs> to write. And uh, when I started to write, then I got the bug and I couldn't stop writing. So I had to have an editor to help me because the book then became an obsession. And it is now like about one third of what it originally was because I just, I ended up, it was like the Encyclopedia Britannica. I couldn't stop. So I, I then w looked at the book and I went, okay, here's a bit about self-development. Here's something about the martial arts and Jeet Kune Do, the, the kind of essential elements of it. And here's something, here's like a a 12-week health and fitness and well-being program. So I, what I did was I pulled those together into a book. And, uh, I, you know, it was my best stab at it, you know, about six or seven years ago. Uh, I'm glad I did it. And I think I said to you recently, I wouldn't want to repeat the experience too soon because <laughs> I thought it was going to crack up. Uh, it was it, it was one of the hardest things I've done, but it was that I, the discipline I had. To, uh, Colette Mason, uh, I got her to edit the book, and she's great because she's very disciplined. And she sort of said, "Martin, this is far too much. I'm going to start chopping this with a big axe. I'm going to axe through this." Um, so she did a great job, I think, in, in terms of making it more readable. Uh, and uh, so it's out there anyway. So it's on Amazon. So I've sold so, the so copies. Yeah. So what would you feel? So you feel that you said you had a, an Encyclopedia Britannica version of it. <laughs> um, are we basically saying we're not going to re go back to that little pond again and start thinking of writing another book? Oh, I might do something at some point. I haven't thought about it. Uh, I might do something, uh, but uh, it's not it's not at the top of my agenda at the minute. I'm I'm just okay. enjoying teaching my class. I have a few students uh, that I teach uh, every week, and I have a kids class that I teach once a week, and I really enjoy the kids class because they're just great. They have no filter and they just tell you, they just tell you exactly what to think. You know, they really are funny. I said to one of them uh, one, the other week, I said, do you not think I'm the best, the best instructor? And they went, no, <laughs> you're an idiot. You're an idiot. <laughs> That's you told. <laughs> that was me putting my place. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, out of the mouths of babes. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel as though you will go back to Seattle to train with Andy or any so. of the others? 
Yeah, I hope so. I was there uh, at Taki's uh, memorial in uh, March. I yeah. went there and there was a series of uh, there was seminars and then the memorial and that was oh that would have brought a, a tear out of a stone that memorial. It was there was there was men there who were really hardcore martial artists, really and steeped in martial arts, and just crying, sobbing their hearts out, and it was like it was amazing. And the stories that were being told about how good Taki was and, and how he quietly helped people. And, you know, he was just an amazing character. And yeah. he didn't he didn't talk about it. You know, he just did things very quietly and helped people. And there were lots of stories like that. They, I think I think the one thing that I learned was, um, you know, Bruce chose his friends very, very carefully. And yeah. Taki Kimura and you know, Sigun Kataki Kimura and Guru Inosanto, amazing people. He yes. knew what he was actually passing it on to. He yes. knew that these were people who were absolutely exceptional people. Um, right. And Taki Kimura, I mean, I remember him picking me up at the Loyal Inn in, on, in Seattle and he had this wonderful car and he took us round everywhere. And he says, you know, when people come to Seattle and ask about Bruce, I take them and I try and give them a li the little tour to sort of like, these were the early days, you know what I mean? And yeah. and I was remembering, he, he took me to this place and he says, oh, this is the mayor of Seattle. And he bought me a club sandwich with my wife, uh, my wife then. And, and, I, and I was sort of like, but I don't know this guy. And he's, you know, he was absolutely, and you must come train with us. And, yeah. you know, from then on, we, we had this great relationship all the way. And I, you know, I, I could never, never, there, there was what a special guy he was. And I would have loved to be there in March. And I'm glad you were there representing it all. Oh, Fantastic. thanks. Yeah. Yeah. When I, when I, it brings to me, when I, when I brought him to Belfast, uh, I brought him for a seminar some years ago, him and Andy and the whole family came over actually and uh, put him on and he taught a really well attended seminar. It was brilliant to have him. You know, it was just fantastic. And, uh, I tried to force money on him for the seminar. I said, here's, you know, here's a fee that, you know, the, the normal fee that you would give to someone of his caliber. And he he didn't want it. He said, you know, he said to Andy the next day, you have to give that back. He wouldn't take any money. He said, I, I don't do this for money. That's what I was the kind yeah. of, no, no instructor has ever forced money back on me that I've given them. You know, no one has ever done that. Uh, yeah. And I think that, you know, as, as you say, you know, when he was in Belfast, they took him to meet the Lord Mayor and the Lord Mayor was a was a former boxer, a former good, he was a good amateur boxer. And he sat for about an hour and a half in the mayor's parlor, quizzing Tacky about Bruce Lee. He was really taken <laughs> and he got Tacky to wear his robes, his mayor robes and the big gold chain and put him in the mayor's seat in the, in the, uh, in that big atrium and Taki was again he was loving it like he was yeah, yeah but as you say Bruce Bruce Lee as you say chose those people very well but he was lucky to have them too because those those people are just paragons of excellence you know yeah Sifu Dan and and, and Taki and they they're fantastic people and they're, they're great ambassadors for for what Bruce Lee stood for so I'm I'm actually extremely lucky to have you know them in in my life and my experience has been a wonderful one in that regard you know. Mm. Do you feel as though you're passing the the the, the it down to another generation? Do you feel as yeah. though you're getting it across to another generation? I hope so. And I've a I've a couple of of people who are assistants to me at the minute and they've stuck with me for years, and I really you couldn't do without them. Uh, David Park and Nal Hughes great guys and you know first class people and they can do the things that I can't do anymore they kick in some of the drills and so on and they're really really good guys um other people have come and gone over the years that they, they come for a few years take what they think they need and then branch off and open a school or wherever and you know good luck to them but I just stick to that path and I just keep with my instructors and those two fellas, David and Nile, that I mentioned, are, are have been with me for oh, some maybe nearly twenty years, and you know, really, really good people. So I'm really lucky to have that because I'm 
I am getting to the stage where I'm thinking I'm going to pop my clogs at some point, and I want to oh, have, okay. I want to have I want to have something you know something there that you kind of go well they're going to continue on and they're going to have the right connections as well with uh, with those people and with the mm -hmm. with that, you know the, the the legacy will be looked after in the right way. Um, so so that's that's a, a wonderful thing. That, that's been absolutely fantastic. I want to wind it up on a, a few sort of like highs now. Is um, do you do you travel much to to um, to spread the word much, or do you just stay in in Ireland, or do do you travel much to do many seminars or anything like that? I don't teach many seminars. I've taught a few in uh, in Dublin and in Belfast, and I just keep pretty low key. Um, and when I get an opportunity then to train with with um, with Andy, uh, as I said, it was there in the springtime. That's wonderful. And also to train with my other instructor, uh, Sifu Alanda Pretter, who lives in Antwerp. And he is the head uh, of the Jun Fan Gung Fu Institute in Europe. He is extremely low key, though. You know, he's a hard guy to find. Uh, he is his students are really fantastic people and their movement is incredible you want to see those guys move incredible movement and very skillful and the best guys in the world he, there's he's so lucky to have them they're lucky to have him Alain's a great guy if you ever get a chance to interview Alain, um you should have a word with him but he's he's very low-key and self-effacing very self-effacing too much in my opinion uh, and I think Tacky was a bit like that too, you know. Uh, you know, he, he used to. He, he said to me one time. He says, "You know, I, I don't know why all these people are asking me these things because I don't really know much." And I'm kind of going, "Come on, you know, don't don't go there because we know that you that you know uh, Bruce Lee taught you really well." So yeah. That's just the way it was. It's it's that it's that wonderful thing that they know they're sharing it to people who are are special because you know people like yourself um, and some others. You know, the, you are you are the ambassadors now. You know, and and it is as I said at the beginning, it's an honour to actually interview you. And we hope we can come back to you at some time and have another chat um, and maybe on a, a, another theme. Is that all right, Martin? Look forward to it. It's been great speaking to you. So thanks oh, again yeah. for the opportunity to have a have a chat with you. And, and yeah. thanks to Will. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. And I'll speak to you soon. All right. Thank you. Take care. Take care. See you, mate. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.